like that. And the only time, the only time she left the Duke was to come to New York in 1956 in order to uh, do some wonderful extravagant shopping and partying with Jimmy Donahue. The clip that you saw in that wonderful movie uh, where she's being interviewed um, by Edward R. Murrow, the reason that that interview took place, it was their, their first televised interview, by the way. The reason it took place was because they wanted to make a very public display of affection. They had decided that, they, that the Jimmy Donahue thing was going to be put aside and that that was over and she was going to remain very loyal to him. That's why she says, my grandmother said that conscience is like a mirror, you must look into it once a day. That, yes. That, that was it. That, that looked it. so rehearsed, yes, I don't it know. Yeah. It yeah. really yeah. looked a little, not right. enough rehearsed perhaps, maybe that's the problem. And I want to make my husband very happy. Yeah, and he, he bought that. Um, you said they weren't paid for their endorsements and they were living, uh, you know, with in-kind gifts and, and traveling in, in high, high fashion. Um, they continued to travel twice a year to the States, but there was a, a definite Palm Beach connection. Um, and we'd, we'd love you to tell us about those people, who those people were, and uh, tell us a little bit about their, their you know, you can give us some dirt, too, if you have any, since it's our zip code, um, about this, this part of the country and their connection. Well, over here, she, uh, she was friendly with Marjorie Merriweather Post, but Marjorie Merriweather Post was much more of a staid individual. Uh, Robert and Anita Young were probably their closest friends. Um, uh, uh, Mr. Young used to send two railroad cars to New York to collect them, to bring them down here to Palm Beach one for their luggage and one for them. Uh, they were friendly with uh, Count and Countess Reventlow, uh, Hogwitz Reventlow. They were friendly with uh, Cece Guest, mm -hmm. probably the closest, and the Horsey set, the Sanfords mm -hmm. and the Woodwards. Mm -hmm. I think uh, one little interesting anecdote was uh, relative to the Woodwards was that, um, as Stephen mentioned in his introductory, um, Anne Woodward fatally shot her husband in, in October of 1955, shortly after, the, the, the morning after the Windsors had had dinner with them, and my parents were there as well. And when someone came into her room in the morning, the Windsors were, were the, uh, that group were very famous horse people. The, and the Woodwards had two double crown winners. The most famous horse was Nashua. And when someone came into her bedroom and said, Duchess, we're terribly sorry to tell you but Ann Woodward has fatally shot in Bill last night. She said, well, thank God she didn't shoot Nashua. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like the horse he said. Is that dirt enough? That's good. It's, we're getting there. We're getting there. Was she a good wife? Um, it looks that way. Um, was she talented sexually? Do we have any... any I mean, she was in China. I mean, you know, people say he was a homosexual and she was a hermaphrodite. Where their rumors are, you know, they're they're wild, yeah. really. Um, so going back to China, you know, and now coming to the present, were there any rumors or about her sexually? There were constant rumors about her sexually. It always amazed me that it was open season from the press to talk about her sexual proclivities in an era when that really wasn't done. She's been called a prostitute, a dominatrix, a hermaphrodite, a right-out man. Uh, I was the administrator of the hospital where she was operated on, and I've seen the nurse's notes. I've waited outside of the operating room when she was being operated on. I, I can promise you that she was a woman. Now, she definitely took and assumed the male, the dominant role in the family. Mm -hmm. There's no question in the marriage. There's no okay. question about that. So that brings me to the question. What about the rumors about him being gay and a homophobe? That often goes hand in hand. Yeah. What's the story with him? Well, um, I think we all know that people who are hysterically homophobic uh, are often concealing something. And, and he was. Uh, he was verbally uh, hysterically homophobic. Uh, there have been constant rumors about his sexuality as it relates to homosexuality. I doubt that there was anything other than one possible, and I've spoken to some historians about this who agree with me, the, the only possible avenue for that was that while they were in the Bahamas, he hired a 17-year-old Bahamian boy 
who remained with him until his death as his inner butler. In other words, in, the, in his room, he took care of his clothes and helped him get dressed. This young man, Sidney Johnson, was extremely loyal and was fired the day after the Duke died. Mm -hmm. So obviously the Duchess didn't like him and Sidney was very close to his master. Mm -hmm. What happened behind closed doors, I, I don't know. Okay. That's some mini dirt, but I like it. Um, <laughs> who were her highest profile celebrity friends? And thinking in terms of her, I put the word friends in quotes. With that s a certain element in that crowd, I'm not sure how close a friend she really ever had. Who were her celebrity friends or, or their celebrity friends? And at the end of her life, and then we're going to get to that, of course, later, but who was her best friend? Um, her best friend, uh, in a par apart from the people we discussed that, were, that they saw in Palm Beach, mm -hmm. uh, her friends were mostly European nobility. And her very best friend was the Countess de Romanes, uh, who was an interesting lady, a lot of fun. Uh, they've been credited, by the way, the Countess de Romanes and the Duchess have been credited with having somehow uh, found spies that the CIA was looking for or identified them. Um, and they had a lot of fun together. And besides C.C. Guest and the Countess de Romanes, there was probably no other people who um, Wallace was very uh, confided in mm -hmm. as much as those two. Mm -hmm. let's, let's jump to um, uh, uh, her husband's, uh, the Duke's, uh, failing health. And um, what happened to him? Uh, the Duke was a chronic smoker. He smoked for 55 years. Uh, she did not smoke. Um, he was a chronic smoker. And he uh, started to have throat problems uh, when they visited the White House in 1970. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was misdiagnosed um, at both in New York and in Paris. They didn't think it was cancer. By the time uh, one of her wealthy friends, C.C. Guest, as a matter of fact, sent an oncologist from here back to Paris to look at him. That oncologist said that it was too late to do anything and he, was, he had advanced throat cancer. He died what I would say was a very admirable death, something that we would probably, the conditions that we would all consider to be a, a good conditions for a premature death. He was at home. He was well cared for. His duchess never left his side. Mm -hmm. He had his dog, Black Diamond, on his bed. And on the night that he died, he opened his eyes two hours before he passed, and he looked at her and he said, Darling, do go get some rest. Those were his last words. And he died two hours later. Mm -hmm. And what happened with, uh, tell us again, with the Queen right before? Uh, most people tend to think that there had been no rapprochement at all between the British royal family and the Windsors, and that's not true. The Duchess wouldn't be buried at Frogmore, the royal cemetery, if that had been the case. And uh, 10 days before he died, Her Majesty the Queen came to Paris with her husband, Prince Philip, and Prince Charles to say goodbye. They made a special trip to say goodbye to the dying uncle. Prince Charles grabbed Wallace, took her in his arms, and called her Aunt Wallace. Uh, the uh, Queen went upstairs to speak to her uncle. From the hospital, we had come and injected him with every primitive steroid we knew in those days because he didn't care if he died that night, but he wanted to be shaved, dressed, and able to get out of his seat and bow to his monarch. Oh. This is around the time, about a year later, you meet the Duchess in your adult life, not in the crossing when you were seven. Um, tell us about the first time you met. Uh, I had been hired by the State Department, USAID, to go over and make a management assessment of the hospital. That hospital happened to be her only charity, as well as the sole beneficiary of her estate. She was the honorary chairman of the hospital board, and so she took a great interest in what was going on. And then this young man, who was the son of a previous friend of hers, was arriving. When I checked in at the embassy and went to the ambassador's office, he said to me, before you even go and get your residency permit and your work permit, you are to call on the Duchess of Windsor. Mm -hmm. And that's the first time I saw her since I had been seven. And she took to you probably because your families knew 
people in common. So you were within that safety zone of the, the privileged in, in, her, in her life. But she personally took to you right away and you became, you became friends, correct? We did. She couldn't go out with a man of her age or of her standing. I was a young man um, who was quite innocently uh, her escort. And she had been, she, would, she confided in me eventually that she was very frightened of going to the first few uh, big social events as a widow. And I escorted her to, to those. Mm -hmm. And so we became friends. She took, um, she took a, a great deal of interest in my, my career because I was constantly threatened with being fired by the hospital. And she would come in to board meetings and slam the table and um, set the record straight. The, the book starts and ends with board meetings where the Duchess is doing that sort of thing. Tell us about the board meeting. Um, the, at the very end, in, in 1975, uh, now remember that this was most assuredly the Duchess's last lucid year. She took it upon herself to save my job and she wanted to put a, to finger the villain in the story, which was a physician who um, was the physician of Aristotle Onassis and was responsible for his death at our hospital. And that same physician wanted to, to get me fired. On the way into the board meeting, she takes my hand and she says, it was good of Ari to die so conveniently to help us, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and she brings that all up and uh, the, the firing didn't take place. Mm -hmm. Her health was failing and over quite some period of time. Um, she was the person who coined the phrase, um, you you're, can never be too thin or too rich. But as a result, she took very bad care of herself maintaining that, that figure. She didn't smoke, but she drank a lot and she didn't eat enough. So I'm sure she probably invented acid reflux with the way she, you know, right. I'm sure she had it, yeah, yeah, you know, I yeah. can only imagine. But, but uh, I don't mean to digress here. Um, related to that, there was a blotched uh, bleeding ulcer apparently that, uh, can you tell us about that? Because you know about her health and I want you to then continue and tell us what most people don't know about the way this, this poor woman left the planet. She had bleeding ulcers all her life. Uh, she suffered from gynecological problems all her life. The, uh, the most probable reason for the gynecological problems was a self-induced abortion while she was in China. Um, she was certainly unable to conceive, and I think that the um, hernias that plagued her for the rest of her life gave rise to this ridiculous theory that she had female testicularism. Um, so in she, as you said, she drank, she said, I don't, it's not that I drink too much, I don't eat enough. Mm -hmm. And she would just, uh, she'd start off the evenings with a few little shots of vodka, uh, and then at table she would just have uh, champagne. Mm -hmm. um, and she had Crohn's disease, she mm -hmm. had spastic colon, all very painful illnesses as we know, and she would, ne she would never reveal that in public. She just mm -hmm. felt that the Duchess of Windsor shouldn't show that kind of weakness. She was uh, badly operated upon shortly after the climactic board meeting, um, and she never really recovered. They kept her in the hospital for three months, um, and uh, all of her friends said it really would have been better if she had been able to die then. Mm -hmm. But she didn't die then. She lived on. Um, her memory was failing. Um, as uh, you will read in the book, if you become gentle readers, you'll see that there were moments of la uh, lapses in her consciousness when we were speaking to each other. Um, but by 1978, she, was, she lost control of her arms and legs. Um, she had to be helped with all of the bodily functions. She was still kept well-groomed in that year and until 1979. But in 1979, they put her back in the hospital for two more operations. And from those, she entered a state which I believe and the neurologists that I have consulted with believe would be called conscious but not alert. She was put on a nasal feeding tube, and she was kept on this nasal feeding tube for six and a half years until mercifully her heart stopped beating two months shy of her 90th mm -hmm. birthday. Mm -hmm. It's a treatment that we wouldn't have our worst enemies undergo. Um, going back, yeah, I wanted to make sure we all heard that. Um, I noticed in the film that she wasted no time ordering a new coat from Givenchy and 
I can't, I'm hard pressed to believe there wasn't something black in her closet, <laughs> you know, <laughs> one of her closets. Um, would she have turned her nose up at Fergie? Uh, I, I think she probably would have felt that Fergie has not behaved regally and not with enough respect for the royal family. That she never, never spoke about the royal family in an abusive or disparaging way. Did she lose after she lost her husband? Did you notice any difference in her, um, her addiction to needing the spotlight? Was oh, that yes. gone once she was not holding up that she, she doll? really, you know, um, there's a, a wonderful expression which was, was uh, um, uh, said that when love is in excess, it leaves a man no honor or worthiness. Euripides said that 450 years before Christ. So I think that that applies, definitely applies to the Duke of Windsor. She had, her, his love for her was suffocating. And she, he would wait outside of her room every night while her hair was being combed. She, he would wait in the car while she was shopping for clothes. Um, and when he died, she, be, she was lost. Mm -hmm. She was lost without that constant That's companion. Will you take any of her secrets to your grave? Or do you have anything you'd like to share with us? Uh, um, something else. She gave me these shoes 35 years ago. Really? Uh, I'll take them to my grave. Well. Um, but, well, I won't take any secrets to my grave. But what I will take to my grave, beyond any question of a doubt, is the fact that with, another British, with a British historian friend of mine, we have bought up a number of pictures that were indiscreetly taken of her while she was on the nasal feeding tube and were indiscreetly taken of her in the hospital in very indelicate positions. We decided to get a hold of those pictures and to never show them. We also decided that we would keep the nurse's notes and we would never reveal those sections of the nurse's notes which would strip her of her dignity. Wonderful. What was she worth? That's wonderful. What was she worth at the end of her life, and who was the sole, or who were the beneficiaries? I've extrapolated the amount of monies that, that, she, that her estate was worth in terms of current day dollars. Mm -hmm. And it was only $20 million. Now, we know that we can live on $20 million, but not in the way that she was, willing, what she was living. When her jewelry was auctioned, a year after her death at the Bowie Vash Hotel in Geneva, it commanded 40 times appraised value and $40 million. So just her jewelry commanded twice the amount of money that she left. Wow. You talked to me about how different their two autobiographies are, and I know you wanted to say something about that. Yes, um, they, each wrote, they each wrote books. His book is rather sterile. It's called A King's Story. Um, if you want to read it, you will learn a lot about his early childhood and about how the monarchy uh, was conducted. It stops at the abdication. He only refers to his friend, Mrs. Simpson. It is dedicated to Wallace. Her book is very interesting. Um, it's self-published. There was no advance. And it's, the title of it is very revealing. It is, The Heart Has Its Reason Which Reason Doesn't Know. And that was a 17th century French philosopher and mathematician who couldn't explain um, uh, irrational love. Mm -hmm. And uh, her book is written in three distinctive styles, which makes me believe that there must have been two ghost writers and the Duchess. It is the cumbersome, difficult to get through passages that I'm quite sure were hers that she begins and ends the book with that are very revealing. And she talks about the fact about love that if it is genuine in the beginning, it never dies and it has a soul. She talks about the only lingering regret that she has, which is that she would never know the love of being a, a, a mother, a child's love. Mm -hmm. it, it's a very lovely book if you can, if you can read it. It's, it's, it's hard to find because it's been out of print for a very long time. The heart has its reason. Mm -hmm. She was known to be tough as nails and pretty ugly at times. Um, you were never the brunt of this, but you witnessed it. In what ways did she act out that kind of... Um... As her amusing hairdresser said in the film, everything had to be perfect. 
And if something wasn't perfect, you were in trouble. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the meet, the, her dinner parties were like brilliantly choreographed theater. Uh, and she kept a little gold book on the side of her, of her plate at dinner parties. I saw this too with a gold pen and she would make comments. And if something was going wrong, the staff was lined up the next day and they were dressed down. Mm -hmm. Now, everybody who worked for her speaks respectfully about her. They said it was very demanding to work for her, but she was always polite. And she knew what she wanted, as De Givenchy says, but that she was polite. She never abused anybody, but when you worked for her, you had to do things just right. Mm -hmm. Well, we could go on forever, but I want to ask uh, now, if we could, Kravis friends, if we could bring the lights up a little bit and open up the audience to any questions he might, they, you might have for our guest, Renee. Well, I mean, isn't he fascinating? Thank you. Thank you. question is about letters, recent letters, um, and that, she, that this lovely woman has heard about, and Renee is asked to elaborate on that. You're very well informed, madame. Um, <laughs> yes, there, uh, there is a, a historian that most of us other historians love to hate, and that lady has written a book, and in the book she reveals these letters. Uh, she claims that um, try to believe this, that the Duchess was a virgin when she married the king. Uh, she had had two husbands, uh, and, and she had had a lot of affairs. Uh, so she wasn't a virgin, uh, but the, those letters claim that, um, and uh, apparently, I think that's what you are referring to. She, she, she did retain a friendship with him. She certainly did not do that with her first husband, Wynne Spencer. She and Ernest and Buttercup, who was the woman who was in the bed in, in the, when the maid found them, uh, and, the, and the Duke, did remain cordial. I wouldn't call them best of friends, but they certainly did remain cordial. Well, they did them a big favor, I would think. You know. Yes, anybody? Yes, sir. No, very good question. No, there wasn't. Neither of them were, were very religious. Um, they did attend, on occasion, ceremonies at the American Cathedral of Paris. Uh, the dean of the American Cathedral of Paris did visit her every week for seven years while she was incapacitated. But no, they were not religious people. Partially. It, 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 it depended on the relationship they had with the hotel. It also depended on, as Stephen talked about, her having created a brand, if she felt um, that she had done enough for them. And if she had made a hotel very famous, yes, they didn't pay the bills. Okay. Hello. Great job. Thank you, Joe. Really, I, I, you know, it was very hard for you when you told me about the Duchess on the feeding tube. Was that in your hospital? No, she was maintained at home. She was sent, shockingly, she was sent back to the hospital on occasion when the staff needed to go on vacation. They would bring this poor woman to the hospital where she would linger until the staff came back from vacation. No, it was in her, bed, in her room. Um, one of the nurses, uh, my favorite nurse, um, and I have her notes as I said, uh, said that she was living in a slum in her room. And no one tried to stop it. Well, you see, the difficulty was that there was no next of kin and there was no individual heir. Had there been individual heirs, they probably would have been looking over people's shoulders. 
There was no next of kin. Arguably, the Queen of England was, uh, was her next of kin. And the British ambassador, as well as the nurse that I just referred to, both went to Buckingham Palace on two separate occasions and begged the Queen to do something. But you see, the Queen really couldn't risk a headline in the paper which would have said, Queen pulls plug on Duchess. It, it was just unheard of. Uh, she might have felt it was inhumane, which it was. And, and for those of us who are dog lovers, I think one of the things that bothered me the most was that they stripped her of her dogs. Um, they, the dogs weren't mistreated, but they were taken away from her. And for those of us who've been really sick and have had the companionship of a dog, you know how very tragic that is. Yes, sir. Yes, um, it is the Seminole Hotel. Uh, it was owned by Uncle Sal, uh, her, her, her uncle, her, her most uh, generous uncle. And she had been a cocktail hostess there uh, when she, before she was married to her first husband. So she spent, I think, a couple of summers working there. Uh, the hotel likes to claim that that's where they stayed when they were here, but I think if any of us go to the Seminole Hotel, you'll understand that they didn't stay there. Uh, she used to take him there once in a while because they had been given a collection of pictures. And uh, they do have a lot of very interesting pictures on the walls. It was at the Seminole Hotel that I discovered evidence that she had, had we, historians claim that she only flew four times. I found a picture there of her boarding the Merriweather, which was Marjorie Merriweather Post's plane. So we documented through them, thankfully, a fifth flight. Yes, ma'am. I beg your pardon? Did she leave a will? Yes. Uh, uh, thank you for bringing that up. And you had discussed it, and I didn't, I didn't respond. I apologize. Um, the, it's very interesting. The hospital that I was running was the sole be beneficiary of her estate while I was there. It would have been like shoveling sand into the ocean if they had received the money. The will was changed definitely after the Duchess was incapacitated. After her hands were so crippled that there was no way she could even shake hands, there is a signature on a new will, Duchess Wallace of Windsor, where she changes the beneficiary from the hospital in question to the Institut Pasteur for AIDS research. And the ultimate irony here is that we've discussed the Duke's homophobia and in the, early in the late 1970s and early 1980s, when AIDS was known as the gay plague and was pretty strictly reserved for, was, was pretty strictly, strictly only affecting gay people, it's supremely ironic that the will was illegally changed, but for a good cause. Yes, sir. I believe that the, the, question, the, the, question, the question is, uh, did the United States, uh, was the United States the beneficiary of her marrying the Duke because what would have happened if the Second World War had taken place while he was king? Is that your, your question, sir? Um, I believe that um, had that happened, and we're hypothesizing, of course, I, I believe that since Neville Chamberlain was replaced by Winston Churchill, I believe that probably the British role in the Second World War would have been much the same as it was. Uh, I believe that given how one can observe how they behaved in the Bahamas, they probably would have behaved similarly in London, which would have meant doing the kinds of things that uh, the current Queen's parents did by going to visit places that had been bombed and by staying in London during the war. Hi. Was there a murder in the Bahamas that they were somehow involved in? Yes, ma'am. Um, there, there was. Uh, there were two killings. We discussed the Woodward killing um, after dinners that they had hosted, the, immediately after the dinners. You're referring to Sir Oakes, Sir Harry Oakes who was an extremely wealthy, rather infamous chap who lived in the Bahamas, who paid for the renovation of Governor's House, by the way. When the Windsors got to the Bahamas, they were appalled. She was appalled 
at the state that Governor's House was in. And the Oakes paid for this ex very extensive and expensive renovation. They became friends. Uh, Harry Oakes was bludgeoned to death and then burned. His body was bludgeoned and then burned and tarred and feathered um, in an old-fashioned kind of uh, way. Uh, the night after um, they had dinner with him, and the Duchess's answer to that one was, well, there's never a dull moment here in the Bahamas. <laughs> and, and the problem arose, I think perhaps you're also referring to a, a bit of an issue. The Duke called the police in Miami, and he asked for Miami to send detectives over to investigate the suicide of Harry Oakes. I think it'd be very hard to kill yourself the way Harry Oakes got <laughs> The son-in-law, these detectives uh, identified the son-in-law as a person of interest. Uh, the son-in-law was arrested and tried and acquitted. I would tend to think not. Of course, I wasn't privy to those conversations. I know the three meetings that they had. Um, I would tend to think not. The, the most moving thing that happened was when the Duke asked the Queen, when he, was suff when he was being operated on in England, if they would allow the Duchess to be buried at Frogmore, the Royal Cemetery. And the, Duch and the Queen said yes. Uh, more importantly than the Queen, the monarch Queen Elizabeth, uh, uh, being gentle with the Windsors towards the end of their life, is the fact that the Queen Mother, Queen Elizabeth's mother, um, was really her nemesis. Uh, there's a wonderful book called Royal Feud, and that one is really worth reading. And it's the feud, the 40-year 40 the 40 decade, the four-decade feud between these two women. What is not known and is not said in that book is that um, wa once Wallace was bedridden, Queen Elizabeth's mother came to Paris and asked to see her. And she had an appointment to see her, but she was turned away. Uh, she was turned away citing ill health, and she sent flowers that said, in friendship, Elizabeth. So even the mother, even the queen mother, who blamed Wallace for the premature death of her husband, that's where, the, that's where this deep-rooted hatred took place. She always felt that her husband, who had become George VI, would have lived a much longer and much better life with his children and she uh, than he did as a king uh, during the war. All the way back there. The Duke used practically all of his income to buy her jewelry. Yes. Uh, you, can, you can get those records so at Cartier. He something. loved buying her jewels. Were they into the performing arts at all? <laughs> I mean, all that money on stuff. Did they attend, did they like opera? Did they like ballet? Did they attend the arts? Theater. At a lot of theater. theater. They loved theater. Well, speaking about books a second ago, um, I want to remind you all that Renee has written three, and they're available. Keep your programs because it, it tells you the title of the book, but they're available on Amazon.com and, and this I Survived Swiss Boarding Schools, among the two others. You cannot put them down. We've been talking about the lives of these fascinating people today, but, but equally as fascinating and, in my opinion, much more triumphant is Renee's life. So on behalf of the Kravis Center and all of our children, thank you for being here. Sensed that he needed a very strong woman by his side. He was a mama's boy, basically, but his mother, Queen Mary, was an extremely frigid woman, probably never hugged him, certainly never kissed him. The only time she kissed him was on the death of her husband when he drew his last breath. Queen Mary fell to her knees, took her son's hand, kissed it, and said, Your Majesty. 
That's not exactly warm and fuzzy. <laughs> so how did he plan to pull off this, um, this whole performance? Um, how's he going to get rid of Ernest? Well, he... Um, the to idea, clear the way, you know? The idea was hatched in 1936 when he was king. Uh, and he calls Ernest in and, uh, to Buckingham Palace. Ernest arrives. And, of course, this is in the days before no-fault divorce. So they had to prove that Ernest was having an affair. And so uh, they made an arrangement that a maid in a hotel would find Ernest in bed uh, with a woman. And then Wallace could sue for divorce, which is what happened. However, everybody sort of knew what was going on. Mm -hmm. So her divorce was granted as a divorce nisi, which means unless. And that unless is unless an impropriety on the accuser's side is discovered. And that's why there was a wait period of six months after he wanted to marry her and until he could. Mm -hmm. What prompted the early abdication? Because he was king for 10 months. Yes. And is he the only person who's ever been a prince, a king, and a duke in a lifetime? Yes. There are a number of firsts. That one, 1936 in England is known as the year of the three kings because that has never happened before, that there were three kings in one year. And he was the only person in British history to have a voluntary abdication. He did not want to be crowned at the end of the year of mourning for his father without her by his side. He felt that that would be dishonest. He was going to marry her on the throne or not, which was his expression. Mm -hmm. Before this, um, she, she was the first woman to be on the cover of Time magazine as Wallace Simpson um, in 1936, correct? It's quite amazing, yes, absolutely. And tell, tell us, uh, Tell us, what qualified this woman to be the woman of the year? I think what Stephen has brought up really illustrates how big a deal this had become, not only in England, but throughout the world. Wallace Simpson, not the Duchess of Windsor yet, was woman of the year in 1936. And she was sandwiched in between Emperor Haile Selassie of Ethiopia for 1935 and Chiang Kai-shek of China for 1937. And here sits the first woman of the year ever, and there have only ever been three women of the year at Time Magazine. So it, 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 I think that really illustrates the huge mountain of gossip and fame that had become her. Mm -hmm. Tell us uh, who the other two were. Was it Queen Elizabeth in 52, was it, in the coronation? Yes. And uh, who's number coronation. three, do we know? Um, uh, Carson Aquino of the Philippines when Ferdinand Marcos was um, uh, removed from office, I think 1987, perhaps 1986. Mm -hmm. What was the fallout with all of this? Because they were sort of, there was sort of an unspoken law that they didn't discuss the personal business in the press in, in, in Britain of the royals. But didn't that change somehow because of the press that they were getting everywhere else? What, what exploded at this time? Yes, exactly. When he was king, uh, for 325 days. He spent practically two of those months um, on a yacht in the Mediterranean with Wallace. Of course, every uh, head of state and every royal family on their tour wanted to meet him. And he brought Wallace to all of those appointments. And he decided then and there that he couldn't have the, he couldn't hold these kinds of meetings ever again without her by his side. And he wanted that marriage to be done before the coronation. To answer mm -hmm. your question, mm -hmm. the foreign press was covering this tour. So people in America were reading about all of this, and the British people didn't know it. But when Br American friends were writing back to their British friends and sending them clippings of articles, that's when the British press decided, went to His Majesty and said, we will now break our silence, and we will be telling the British people what's going on. Mm -hmm. Prior to the abdication, what was, uh, I remember you're telling me about a, a suggested solution to this fiasco at home. What, what was suggested to them to fix this? The head of the London Times came to both the King and to Mrs. Simpson and suggested something called a morganatic marriage. 
And a morganatic marriage is when a higher noble marries a lower noble or a commoner. And what it does is it sets up a precedence where none of the children will inherit the title and none of the children will inherit the estates, the royal estates. Believe it or not, while that, that concept might have flown, Winston Churchill advised them to push that and that it might work. The king wouldn't do it. He said, she's either going to be my full wife in every aspect or it's not going to happen. Was that an excuse and did he really want to be the king? Didn't look it. I mean, the little I know, he didn't do a thing with his life, really. He had very clever answers to questions and he seemed to be in the back seat and she was driving Mr. Daisy through this entire relationship. <laughs> You're right. Um, it didn't look like he wanted to be the king, and what a great excuse, yes. what a setup. I, I think great, right. he, could be a, he could be remembered as a martyr. I, I think you're right. There's no question that he was much happier as the king of international high society than he could ever have been as the king of England. Mm -hmm. He abhorred the formality of the British royal family. He abhorred state dinners. Mm -hmm. He thought they were a tremendous waste. Remember, while he was Prince of Wales, he traveled constantly. He was the first member of the British royal family to visit every corner of the empire. He stayed out of London as much as possible. During all of this, was she in hiding, at least in the beginning? Did, was she completely criticized and annihilated by the, the Brits, the Americans? What was the fallout for her initially? Well, you see, the only way the British people could explain the fact that their beloved king was considering abandoning them, their, their their king, their charming, popular, uh, liberal king was about to abandon them. The only way to explain it was that he had been possessed by a witch, a twice divorced American witch. And so all of the problems were laid at her door. That's the way they could kind of uh, not feel abandoned, have a reason for the abandonment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, let's talk about their wedding a little bit. Was it grand? Who came? And is there anything um, memorable about it. The wedding was very sad. It took place on the 3rd of June 1937 at the Chateau de Condé, a magnificent home near Tours. The problem was that two days before the wedding a letter arrived from Buckingham Palace which said that she would forever be denied the title of HRH, Her Royal Highness. That didn't bother her really that much but it bothered him tremendously because it meant that the royal family had taken an unprecedented move to declare her as not being his legal wife. If you are married to a royal, you are entitled to the title. And so this bothered him terribly. So that, he was very upset by, for, for the wedding. The same day, her, her dog was bitten by a, a viper and died. So that was a second bad omen. And the, uh, so there were very few guests because in the same letter, it was also revealed that no member of the British royal family would attend. No member of his family would attend. His best man was his chief of staff while he was king, a man by the name of Fruity Metcalf. Um, her best man was a friend of hers from her China days. And there was just a handful of guests, and it was very sad. At the conclusion of the ceremony, when go, the priest is going to write something into the wedding book, he looks up at the Duke and he says, how do I address uh, your wife? And, he, and the King and the Duke says, you write Her Royal Highness, the Duchess of Windsor. Oh. Was there something borrowed, something blue? Dot, there dot, was. dot. There was. Yeah. Um, let's see, uh, something borrowed was uh, a handkerchief from her beloved Aunt Bessie without whom, by the way, we would know very little about all this. Bessie kept good diaries in all of her letters. Let's see, something new uh, was a gold sovereign that had been minted for his coronation, which was in her wedding slipper. Something, what comes out? Something old, uh, some antique lace in her, in her lingerie. Borrowed. Borrowed, borrowed was the, um, the handkerchief. And blue, blue was the color of her dress, which became well known as Wallace Blue and is very similar to Tiffany Blue. Mm -hmm. and we saw her wearing that magnificent scarf mm -hmm. uh, during the interview in her home. You taught me in a conversation, and may, forgive me if I get it wrong, but each king has the, the sovereign made. And even though he was 10 months and counting as the king, was there, I'm not sure, was there one made 
for him, that they, it's gold and they circulate it for a short time? Or, yes. Can you tell us about that? Exactly. Uh, it was sort of a cute anecdote I think you're referring to. Um, in, in the British monarchy, every sovereign, is, uh, as his new uh, sovereign is minted, will change sides. So you will know the even and the odd number of the, of the monarch. And his father had, had his minted showing his left side. The Duchess didn't feel that that was his best looking side. <laughs> and uh, that the right one would have been. So she insisted that they break tradition. And, and so the only time in history where there's a monarch shown from the same side in, two, in, in sequence was his. Okay. All right. So I think. They, they lived in Paris at first and then came the war. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let's get this out in the open and talk in detail about their Nazi sympathization, if there is such a word. He was invited, we hear, by Hitler um, to, to be the guests. Uh, he courted them, and Hitler promised that he would reinstate him as the king once they defeated Britain. Now, he might not have been a rocket scientist, but would he really have been that kind of a man to want to turn on an entire country um, for, for a position he didn't really seem to want in the first place. What's, what's the real story here? We have to have a, a bit of a t historical timeline. Um, they were married in 1937, as I said. As many of us know, the war broke out on the 2nd of September, 1939. In that two-year period is when the tensions began to grow in Europe, when Hitler started to eat away at something called the Treaty of Versailles, which was signed after the First World War in 1919. Up until that time, the concept of appeasement uh, was practiced by the British government, the British cabinet, as well as the royal family. And appeasement meant that you should be easy on the punitive terms of the Treaty of Versailles. It, Winston Churchill was the only voice in the desert who was warning people that the military buildup and the, the changes and the challenges to the Treaty of Versailles were quite serious. Also, let's remember that, that the Duke's great-grandmother, Queen Victoria, had, had made her relatives, seated her relatives on every royal family throughout Europe. So the Kaiser and his family were first cousins to the, the Duke. He spoke fluent German. He had spent a lot of time in Germany during the summers. And it wasn't uncommon for the, popular for, for the British royal family to like and to associate with the German royal family and the government. Mm -hmm. When they went to see Hitler in 1938, it was still a year before the Treaty of Munich, which is when Neville Chamberlain, the, the, the Prime Minister, comes back with the Treaty of Munich, which was a non-aggression pact. So for them to have gone a year before the Treaty of Munich really it was not, was, didn't indicate that Makes they were not in sympathizers. Yeah. Hitler did not say to them that he wanted to reinstate them as a puppet monarchy. That was a rumor, a credible rumor, that once discovered is why the royal family and the British government whisked them off to the Bahamas. Okay, so now we're at the Bahamas. Um, and besides shopping sprees in Palm Beach and New York, she went to work there, really. What, was that nurse photo shoot just a photo op? No, no, she, she really did. She was a very active uh, head of the Red Cross. Um, the press has steadfastly refused to acknowledge the fact that she always had one charity that she was very involved with. It began there. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were a number of stories where she was very good to the soldiers. Uh, on one occasion, she ordered her driver to stop their car coming home late at night and she, because she saw some soldiers in the street. And she said to them, what, what are you doing? And they said that they were hungry and that they had heard that at the Red Cross canteen they could have a meal. But it was midnight. She, had, she put them in the car, she took them to the canteen, she opened the door and cooked them ham and eggs. And she apparently made them laugh and had quite a nice evening all night with them. Mm -hmm. After the war, they felt, or I'm, I'm thinking in terms of her, felt it was probably her idea to go back and say, the war is over, appoint us something. Right? Exactly. They, yes. they had accomplished something, they had done what they were told. What transpired when they went back? Their first stop after the war was in London. He went to Buckingham Palace for the first and only time that he went without her. He refused to go there anymore without her. He spoke to his brother, King George VI, who said that you will never have a job with us. 
He went to see the Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, and Winston Churchill confirmed the same thing. And it was then that the Duchess made a very clear decision, very conscious, very clear decision that she had to take over. Mm -hmm. Her husband would never have a job, um, and if she didn't do something to keep him busy, to keep him occupied, and if she didn't do something to find the resources and the funds to keep them uh, established in the royal manner, it, it wasn't going to happen. So she takes over very consciously in 1944 and 1945. And that's when the, 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 her branding of herself and her husband began. She again makes lemonade out of lemons. It's her, it's her history. Um, what did they live on financially? How much was he getting uh, as, as a member of the royal family before all of this, if you know, and put it in today's terms. And then when they were denied after the Bahamas and the war, were they just not getting anything? Um, the, his father, the Duke of Windsor's father, King George V, disinherited his son shortly before his death. He believed, they had a feeling that he wasn't going to take being king very seriously. And they believed that if they disinherited him, that if he was without funds, he would be anchored to the monarchy. He would be anchored to the throne. There was no, nothing else he could possibly do. So they would have financial problems their entire life. The royal family gave him a small stipend, and he had a little bit of resources from some of the estates that, are, that pay the Prince of Wales until there is a new Prince of Wales. Mm -hmm. They did not have anything near the amount of funds that they required in order to stay friends with the kinds of people that they were associated with. Mm -hmm. That's where her brand came in. Mm -hmm. And how did she start this? I mean, from jewelry to fashion to ocean liners to you name it. How did she approach this? Um, and was she paid? Were they paid a fee? I know they were given their clothes, they were given their airline, or, well, she didn't fly, as you, as you told me, but they were giving their transatlantics, all cabins and first class, and how did she go about this, and, and were they paid for this? No. Um, they were paid in kind. They weren't paid in funds. Mm -hmm. Um, Cunard used to give them the two best suites on a ship plus five cabins for employees and several different stewards to take the 120 pieces of monogram Louis Vuitton luggage back and forth. To, and, uh, and they were thrilled to do it for free. And the reason they would do that is that if there was a byline in the paper saying that the Windsors were going to be on a particular sailing of the Queen Mary, that sailing would go from underbook to overbook in a minute, instantly the same day. When she saw those sort of things happening, why did they have Louis Vuitton luggage? Because she liked Louis Vuitton. They told her that she could have as much of it as she wanted, specially made, specially monogrammed. Her Dior purses had to have specially made clasps with the WE, their monogram for Wallace and Edward. She very quickly learned that where the Windsors went, society followed, and what she wore, everybody wanted. Was there a favorite jeweler and a favorite designer? Uh, her favorite designers were Hubert de Givenchy, who, who we saw in yeah. the film, who became a, a friend of hers as well mm -hmm. as her designer. She liked very much a, uh, a rather obscure designer by the name of Madame Gray, G-R-E-S, um, who uh, wasn't quite at the, at the level of fame, and Balenciaga and Dior. Mm -hmm. Jewelers was Cartier. They were two peas in a pod, 99% of their, their lives, except for one little moment of perhaps indiscretion on her part with Jimmy Donahue? Yes. Can you tell us that story? Yes. Um, there was, in their 36-year marriage, um, there was probably only one period during which there was some tension. And it was exactly, you were right, it was about Jimmy Donahue, who was the first cousin to Marjorie Merriweather Post. And uh, he was very wealthy, extremely flamboyant homosexual. And the, the joke was that she had married a king, but she was dating a queen. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> sensed that he needed a very strong woman by his side. He was a mama's boy, basically. But his mother, Queen Mary, was an extremely frigid woman. Probably never hugged him, certainly never kissed him. The only time she kissed him was on the death of her husband when he drew his last breath Queen Mary fell to her knees, took her son's hand, kissed it, and said, Your Majesty. That's not exactly warm and fuzzy. 
<laughs> so how did he plan to pull off this, um, this whole performance? Um, how's he going to get rid of Ernest? Well, he... Um, the to idea, clear the way, you know? The idea was hatched in 1936 when he was king. Uh, and he calls Ernest in and, uh, to Buckingham Palace. Ernest arrives. And, of course, this is in the days before no-fault divorce. So they had to prove that Ernest was having an affair. And so uh, they made an arrangement that a maid in a hotel would find Ernest in bed uh, with a woman. And then Wallace could sue for divorce, which is what happened. However, everybody sort of knew what was going on. Mm -hmm. So her divorce was granted as a divorce nisi, which means unless. And that unless is unless an impropriety on the accuser's side is discovered. And that's why there was a wait period of six months after he wanted to marry her and until he could. Mm -hmm. What prompted the early abdication? Because he was king for 10 months. Yes. And is he the only person who's ever been a prince, a king, and a duke in a lifetime? Uh, yes. There are a number of firsts. That one. 1936 in England is known as the year of the three kings because that has never happened before, that there were three kings in one year. And he was the only person in British history to have a voluntary abdication. He did not want to be crowned at the end of the year of mourning for his father without her by his side. He felt that that would be dishonest. He was going to marry her on the throne or not, which was his expression. Mm -hmm. Before this... Um, she, she was the first woman to be on the cover of Time magazine as Wallace Simpson um, in 1936, correct? It's quite amazing. Yes, absolutely. Tell, tell, us, tell us what qualified this woman to be the woman of the year. I think what Stephen has brought up really illustrates how big a deal this had become, not only in England but throughout the world. Wallace Simpson, not the Duchess of Windsor yet, was Woman of the Year in 1936. And she was sandwiched in between Emperor Haile Selassie of Ethiopia for 1935 and Chiang Kai-shek of China for 1937. And here sits the first Woman of the Year ever. And there have only ever been three Women of the Year at Time magazine. So it, 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 I think that really illustrates the huge mountain of gossip and fame that had become her. Mm -hmm. Tell us uh, who the other two were. Was it Queen Elizabeth in 52, was it, in the coronation? Yes. And uh, who's number coronation. three, do we know? Um, uh, Carson Aquino of the Philippines when Ferdinand Marcos was um, uh, removed from office, I think 1987, perhaps 1986. Mm -hmm. What was the fallout with all of this? Because they were sort of, there was sort of an unspoken law that they didn't discuss the personal business in the press in, in, in Britain of the royals, but didn't that change somehow because of the press that they were getting everywhere else? What, what exploded at this time? Yes, exactly. When he was king uh, for 325 days, he spent practically two of those months um, on a yacht in the Mediterranean with Wallace. Of course, every uh, head of state and every royal family on their tour wanted to meet him. And he brought Wallace to all of those appointments. And he decided then and there that he couldn't have the, he couldn't hold these kinds of meetings ever again without her by his side. And he wanted that marriage to be done before the coronation. To answer mm -hmm. your question, mm -hmm. the foreign press was covering this tour. So people in America were reading about all of this, and the British people didn't know it. But when Br American friends were writing back to their British friends and sending them clippings of articles, that's when the British press decided, went to His Majesty and said, we will now break our silence and we will be telling the British people what's going on. Mm -hmm. Prior to the abdication, what was, uh, I remember you're telling me about a, a suggested solution to this fiasco at home. What, what was suggested to them to fix this? The head of the London Times came to both the king and to Mrs. Simpson and suggested something called a morganatic marriage. 
And a morganatic marriage is when a higher noble marries a lower noble or a commoner. And what it does is it sets up a precedence where none of the children will inherit the title and none of the children will inherit the estates, the royal estates. Believe it or not, while that, that concept might have flown, Winston Churchill advised them to push that and that it might work. The king wouldn't do it. He said, she's either going to be my full wife in every aspect or it's not going to happen. Was that an excuse and did he really want to be the king? Didn't look it. I mean, the little I know, he didn't do a thing with his life, really. He had very clever answers to questions and he seemed to be in the back seat and she was driving Mr. Daisy through this entire relationship. <laughs> You're right. Um, it didn't look like he wanted to be the king. And what a great excuse. Yes. What a setup. I, I think great. Right. He, could be a, he could be remembered as a martyr. I, I think you're right. There's no question that he was much happier as the king of international high society than he could ever have been as the king of England. Mm -hmm. He abhorred the formality of the British royal family. He abhorred state dinners. Mm -hmm. He thought they were a tremendous waste. Remember, while he was Prince of Wales, he traveled constantly. He was the first member of the British royal family to visit every corner of the empire. He stayed out of London as much as possible. During all of this, was she in hiding, at least in the beginning? Did, was she completely criticized and annihilated by the, the Brits, the Americans? What was the fallout for her initially? Well, you see, the only way the British people could explain the fact that their beloved king was considering abandoning them, their, their, their king, their charming, popular, uh, liberal king was about to abandon them. The only way to explain it was that he had been possessed by a witch, a twice-divorced American witch. And so all of the problems were laid at her door. That's the way they could kind of uh, not mm -hmm. feel abandoned, have a, a reason for the abandonment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, let's talk about their wedding a little bit. Was it grand? Who came? And is there anything um, memorable about it? The wedding was very sad. It took place on the 3rd of June, 1937, at the Chateau de Condé, a magnificent home near Tours. The problem was that two days before the wedding, a letter arrived from Buckingham Palace which said that she would forever be denied the title of HRH, Her Royal Highness. That didn't bother her really that much, but it bothered him tremendously because it meant that the royal family had taken an unprecedented move to declare her as not being his legal wife. If you are married to a royal, you are entitled to the title. And so this bothered him terribly. So that, he was very upset by, for, for the wedding. The same day, her, her dog was bitten by a, a viper and died, so that was a second bad omen. And it, the, uh, so there were very few guests, because in the same letter, it was also revealed that no member of the British royal family would attend. No member of his family would attend. His best man was his chief of staff while he was king, a man by the name of Fruity Metcalf. Um, her best man was a friend of hers from her China days. And there was just a handful of guests, and it was very sad. At the conclusion of the ceremony, when go, the priest is going to write something into the wedding book, he looks up at the duke, and he says, how do I address uh, your wife? And, he, and the king and the duke says, you write Her Royal Highness, the Duchess of Windsor. Oh. Was there something borrowed, something blue? Dot, there dot, was. dot. There was. Yeah. Um, let's see, uh, something borrowed was uh, a handkerchief from her beloved Aunt Bessie, without whom, by the way, we would know very little about all this. Bessie kept good diaries in all of her letters. Let's see, something new uh, was a gold sovereign that had been minted for his coronation, which was in her wedding slipper. Something, what comes out? Something old, uh, some antique lace in her, in her lingerie. Borrowed, borrowed. Borrowed was the, um, the handkerchief. And blue was the color of her dress, which became well known as Wallace blue, and is very similar to Tiffany blue. Mm -hmm. And we saw her wearing that magnificent scarf mm -hmm. uh, during the interview in her home. You taught me in a conversation, and I may, forgive me if I get it wrong, but each king has the, the sovereign made. And even though he was 10 months and counting as the king, was there, I'm not sure, was there one made 
for him, that they, it's gold and they circulate it for a short time? Or, yes. Can you tell us about that? Exactly. Uh, it was sort of a cute anecdote I think you're referring to. Um, in, in the British monarchy, every sovereign is, uh, as his new uh, sovereign is minted, will change sides. So you will know the even and the odd number of the, of the monarch. And his father had, had his minted showing his left side. The Duchess didn't feel that that was his best looking side. <laughs> and uh, that the right one would have been. So she insisted that they break tradition. And, and so the only time in history where there's a monarch shown from the same side in, two, in, in sequence was his. Okay. All right. So I think. They, they lived in Paris at first and then came the war. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let's get this out in the open and talk in detail about their Nazi sympathization, if there is such a word. He was invited, we hear, by Hitler um, to, to be the guests. Uh, he courted them. And Hitler promised that he would reinstate him as the king once they defeated Britain. Now, he might not have been a rocket scientist. But would he really have been that kind of a man to want to turn on an entire country um, for, for a position he didn't really seem to want in the first place? What's, what's the real story here? We have to have a, a bit of a t historical timeline. Um, they were married in 1937, as I said. As many of us know, the war broke out on the 2nd of September, 1939. In that two-year period is when the tensions began to grow in Europe, when Hitler started to eat away at something called the Treaty of Versailles, which was signed after the First World War in 1919. Up until that time, the concept of appeasement uh, was practiced by the British government, the British cabinet, as well as the royal family. And appeasement meant that you should be easy on the punitive terms of the Treaty of Versailles. It, Winston Churchill was the only voice in the desert who was warning people that the military buildup and the, the changes and the challenges to the Treaty of Versailles were quite serious. Also, let's remember that, that the Duke's great-grandmother, Queen Victoria, had, had made her relatives, seated her relatives on every royal family throughout Europe. So the Kaiser and his family were first cousins to the, the Duke. He spoke fluent German. He had spent a lot of time in Germany during the summers. And it wasn't uncommon for the, popular, for, for the British royal family to like and to associate with the German royal family and the government. Mm -hmm. When they went to see Hitler in 1938, it was still a year before the Treaty of Munich, which is when Neville Chamberlain, the, the, the prime minister, comes back with the Treaty of Munich, which was a non-aggression pact. So for them to have gone a year before the Treaty of Munich really it was not, was, didn't indicate that Makes they were Nazi in sympathizers. Yeah. Hitler did not say to them that he wanted to reinstate them as a puppet monarchy. That was a rumor, a credible rumor, that once discovered is why the royal family and the British government whisked them off to the Bahamas. Okay, so now we're at the Bahamas. Um, and besides shopping sprees in Palm Beach and New York, she went to work there, really. Was that nurse photo shoot just a photo op? No. No, she, she really did. She was a very active uh, head of the Red Cross. Um, the press has steadfastly refused to acknowledge the fact that she always had one charity that she was very involved with. It began there. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were a number of stories where she was very good to the soldiers. Uh, on one occasion, she ordered her driver to stop their car coming home late at night and she, because she saw some soldiers in the street, and she said to them, what, what are you doing? And they said that they were hungry and that they had heard that at the Red Cross canteen they could have a meal, but it was midnight. She, had, she put them in the car, she took them to the canteen, she opened the door and cooked them ham and eggs. And she apparently made them laugh and had quite a nice evening all night with them. Mm -hmm. After the war, they felt, or I'm, I'm thinking in terms of her, felt it was probably her idea to go back and say, the war's over, appoint us something. Right? Exactly. They, yes. they had accomplished something. They had done what they were told. What transpired when they went back? Their first stop after the war was in London. He went to Buckingham Palace for the first and only time that he went without her. He refused to go there anymore without her. He spoke to his brother, King George VI, who said that you will never have a job with us. 
He went to see the Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, and Winston Churchill confirmed the same thing. And it was then that the Duchess made a very clear decision, very conscious, very clear decision that she had to take over. Mm -hmm. Her husband would never have a job, um, and if she didn't do something to keep him busy, to keep him occupied, and if she didn't do something to find the resources and the funds to keep them uh, established in the royal manner, it, it wasn't going to happen. So she takes over very consciously in mm -hmm. 1944 and 1945. And that's when the, 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 her branding of herself and her husband began. She again makes lemonade out of lemons. It's her, it's her history. Um, what did they live on financially? How much was he getting? Uh, as, as a member of the royal family before all of this, if you know, and put it in today's terms. And then when they were denied after the Bahamas and the war, were they just not getting anything? Um, the, his father, the Duke of Windsor's father, King George V, disinherited his son shortly before his death. He believed, they had a feeling that he wasn't going to take being king very seriously. And they believed that if they disinherited him, that if he was without funds, he would be anchored to the monarchy. He would be anchored to the throne. There was no, nothing else he could possibly do. So they would have financial problems their entire life. Mm -hmm. The royal family gave him a small stipend, and he had a little bit of resources from some of the estates that, are, that pay the Prince of Wales until there is a new Prince of Wales. Mm -hmm. They did not have anything near the amount of funds that they required in order to stay friends with the kinds of people that they were associated with. Mm -hmm. That's where her brand came in. Mm -hmm. And how did she start this? I mean, from jewelry to fashion to ocean liners to you name it. How did she approach this? Um, and was she paid? Were they paid a fee? I know they were given their clothes, they were given their airliner. Well, she didn't fly, as you, as you told. But they were giving their transatlantics, all cabins and first class. And how did she go about this? And, and were they paid for this? No. Um, they were paid in kind. They weren't paid in funds. Mm -hmm. um, Cunard used to give them the two best suites on a ship plus five cabins for employees and several different stewards to take the 120 pieces of monogrammed Louis Vuitton luggage back and forth. To, and, uh, and they were thrilled to do it for free. And the reason they would do that is that if there was a byline in the paper saying that the Windsors were going to be on a particular sailing of the Queen Mary, that sailing would go from underbook to overbook in a minute, instantly the same day. When she saw those sort of things happening, why did they have Louis Vuitton luggage? Because she liked Louis Vuitton, and they told her that she could have as much of it as she wanted, specially made, specially monogrammed. Her Dior purses had to have specially made clasps with the WE, their monogram for Wallace and Edward. She very quickly learned that where the Windsors went, society followed, and what she wore, everybody wanted. Was there a favorite jeweler and a favorite designer? Uh, her favorite designers were Hubert de Givenchy, who, who we saw in yep. the film, who became a, a friend of hers as well mm -hmm. as her designer. She liked very much a, uh, a rather obscure designer by the name of Madame Gray, G-R-E-S, um, who uh, wasn't quite at the, at the level of fame, and Balenciaga and Dior. Mm -hmm. Jewelers was Cartier. They were two peas in a pod, 99% of their, their lives, except for one little moment of perhaps indiscretion on her part with Jimmy Donahue? Yes. Can you tell us that story? Yes. Um, there was, in their 36-year marriage, um, there was probably only one period during which there was some tension. And it was exactly right. It was about Jimmy Donahue, who was the first cousin to Marjorie Merriweather Post. And uh, he was very wealthy, extremely flamboyant homosexual. And the, the joke was that she had married a king, but she was dating a queen. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs>